Amen. I hope and pray that, in God's mercy, we can sing those words with genuineness and sincerity, uh, that He is our greatest treasure. And it is uh, in this treasure we want to find our comfort, our help, our instruction today. So I want to invite you first to turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and set the direction. Our primary tools from God for worship today are the emblems that we will share in. If you didn't pick one up, again, for uh, those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, who have given their lives to Him in faith and repentance, uh, for believers, uh, we've made those available on the way in out of concern for health and safety. And these emblems, well, it seems a little bit tacky in this format. Uh, these are important things for us to think about today and really are at the center, uh, the, the tool that is at the center of our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to begin with 1 Corinthians 11 and be reminded of the seriousness of what we do when we gather around the table. And again, quickly, for, for those of you who are here today and in your heart you know you're not a Christian, you know you haven't abandoned your selfish pride and your sin and have being the captain of your own soul, you haven't bowed the knee to Jesus, you haven't found forgiveness in life in Him, you know that's not true of you. I want you to know that I and we are very glad that you are here today. We want you to see and hear and understand and, and to think very seriously about what these two little things represent uh, to those who know and love Jesus. It's really good that you're here. Uh, but I encourage you to watch. I encourage you to observe. Um, the words I'm going to read now from 1 Corinthians 11 are written to a church uh, by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit in response to errors, great errors that they were making in their worship of Christ around these emblems. And there were serious consequences for them, immediate consequences for them, because they misunderstood and misapplied the instructions of Jesus in remembering Him until He comes. So I want to begin there. I want to read these words. I want them in your heart and mind. That sets the trajectory for us to the moment when we share in these emblems together. Uh, and then we're going to spend just a few moments in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. And I'll explain how I hope and pray that verse will help us prepare to share in the emblems in just a moment. But first, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to begin at verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead and with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat before, eat something at home so that when you meet together, it will not result in judgment. Please bow with me in a word of prayer.
Father, again, we are grateful to have your word. Thank you that you have spoken. You've revealed yourself to us through your word. And thank you for the light you give us by the Spirit that we can understand it and it comes to life. It brings us life, Father. So thank you for the gift of the word. And, and we need your help today, again, always, that we would understand that the truths that you've given to us in Scripture, that my mind and heart now in this moment, that I would receive these things with, with an eager hunger a longing to know you and to know this truth and have it reshape me and mold my life. Would you give this to me, Father, this morning and to each one gathered here and to those who may be watching from home, wherever they are receiving your word, I pray, Father, you have promised it will not return to you void, empty. It will have an impact. So we're praying for that impact today. And Father, I pray as well, acknowledging that uh, in any day and in these days, there are many things that worry us, distract us, I grab our attention, uh, seem to pressure us in terms of our focus and priorities. And so we're asking for your help now, Father, that we might just again, by your Spirit, be drawn into Scripture and to see Jesus. And we do pray, Father, especially for uh, those who are suffering and struggling, even in this moment, I think of Julie's mom, Julie, ha Julie Hamilton's mom, Laura's grandma. And we know, Father, that she is very sick and it would seem very near the end. But we are grateful that she knows you and loves you, that you have done a work of grace in her life. I thank you, Father. I've heard reports of her eagerness to go home and be with Jesus. Only a Christian can say those kinds of things. I thank you for that hope that is embedded there in her soul. And I pray that in these days, I pray for a protection against the discomfort and pain that come in the valley of the shadow of death. I pray, Father, your protection over her against the attack of the enemy, the spiritual warfare that takes place as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I pray, Father, that she would know in an intense way your presence, your comfort, your goodness for her, as you will in your time bring her home. And I pray for great comfort for Julie, for Laura, for all of the family. Just uh, even in this moment, wherever they are, I pray that you would fill them with the truths of Scripture that comfort the heart for all those who know and love Jesus. And, Father, for all of our hearts, for whatever may be troubling us in this moment, help us to just release that, to cast that burden and care upon you right now so that we might hear your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians, it's always fun to try and say that in public. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I was, last week, uh, we shared, I don't know, 30 to 40, somewhere in there, passages of Scripture that uh, you, uh, our family here, had shared with me. Things, passages of Scripture that God had used to feed, encourage, instruct, rebuke, challenge you, and I was remarkably blessed, and I know many of you were as well, to hear those, how, how it is God had taken His sheep to the to the, to the field where the food is, to the scriptures, and how those scriptures helped and encouraged. I was desperately nervous last week about missing someone. And so I went over the emails again and again and again, only to forget that someone sent me a text. And I forgot. I forgot that they sent me the text. And you're all dear to me, but this person is very dear to me. So I'm using that text this morning, not just because I feel guilty. That's probably a bad motivation tool when it comes to what shall I preach on on any given Sunday. Uh, but because as I went to this text after last Sunday morning, um, I just found great help in it. Even as I was thinking about coming to this moment with all of you and sharing in the emblems of the death of Jesus. So my hope and prayer is the reason we're using this passage is to get our heads and our hearts. Let me put it another way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, everyone here needs to examine themselves before sharing in the cup and before sharing in the bread. And so I want to step, just share with you a few thoughts and step through a couple of things in 1 Thessalonians that I hope will help us examine ourselves today and give us pause. There may be some conviction that goes on. If it's of the Spirit, that is, if we're examining ourselves being led by the Spirit, there will be some conviction. I don't know if you've noticed, but your family has. You're not perfect. There's been sin in your life this week, so 
The examination is going to come with some measure of conviction, but I hope it will also come with a great measure of comfort. As we'll see in the passage, it, it moves us from the, oh, just the vulnerabilities and the uncertainties and the, uh, the tossed on the waves perspective of my faith. It moves me from looking at myself and my weakness and it moves me to look into the very face of the God who is faithful and has promised that he will complete the work that he's begun. The verses I want to share with you are chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It's a beautiful prayer that Paul records and relates to the believers in Thessalonica. It's a powerful prayer. Let me encourage you just with this one thought on prayer. We're not thinking primarily about prayer, though it's good to learn about prayer from Paul's prayers. But the one thing that I've learned from Paul and his prayers is it's always good to ask God for the things he's promised to give us. It's always good to ask God for the things he's promised to give us. There's a, there's a great affirmative response from God when we ask for the things that He's promised. And that's a big part of what Paul is doing here. How can this little prayer help us? It's actually the third of three prayers in the book of Thessalon- Thessalonians. And the, really the letter seems to be framed around these prayers. Let me read the other ones for you. Chapter 1 and verse 2. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a prayer of thanksgiving, isn't it? Because Paul has seen evidence of a genuine faith response to the gospel. These are believers he's writing to, and so he prays with thanksgiving for the evidence of God's grace in their life. And then in chapter 3, verse 11, Now may our God and Father himself, again, similar emphasis to what we'll see in This last prayer, may God and Father himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase, overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Then he goes into some instructions, some uh, addressing a need, a, an issue, a concern in their lives, and practical instruction, and then the verses I just read at the end. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Well, if this verse is going to help us at all, it, we do need to understand something about Paul and his relationship with the people in this church. He loves these people as he does all of the churches he writes to, but it's, it's helpful to see the way he describes his relationship with these believers that he is then praying for the prayer that we, we looked at. Look at chapter 2 and verse 7. We were like young children among you, Paul says. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And then down in verse 11, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And again in verse 19, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. You get a sense of the very vital, powerful relationship between the apostle and these believers. He he cares, he is deeply invested in their spiritual well-being. And that's, in large portion, why he writes because he, ad- he addresses a concern immediately with them. He loves them, and he prays for them, and he's concerned for them because he's heard of some trouble. 
chapter two and verse 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Again, it doesn't go in to describe all of the details. But Paul is saying these believers, when they gave their hearts and aligned themselves in faith with Jesus, they came under attack. And they came under attack from their own people, even likely their own families. There was a great cost involved. And so Paul is concerned, what effect will this persecution have on their hearts? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and our co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And, in turn, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might be in vain. Do you see his concern? They'd started well. They had trusted in Christ, clear evidences of faith. They had now come under persecution. And I suspect, and I, I don't want to put thoughts or words in Paul's mind or on his lips, but I suspect Paul knows how powerful persecution is when it comes to causing us to wonder if we're going in the right direction. Paul was a man who was persecuted, and he pleaded with God's people to pray for him in those persecutions. I believe that's because he knew his own weakness and his need for more grace. And so it's out of a heart that had experienced great persecution. How might those things affect these little babes in Christ? And so he, he sends Timothy, his co-worker, to find out about that. And look at verse 6 of chapter 3. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Timothy's gone. But Paul says, I can't get there, Tim. You've got to go find out how they're doing. And Timothy goes and he comes back again. These trips took a little bit longer than our trips take today. And when Timothy arrives back with Paul, he gets a good report. They're doing well. They're, doing, they're going on with Jesus. And Paul is filled with great joy. But that leads him as an apostle, as their spiritual father, to a place where I want to make sure you keep going. Right? I want to instruct you. I want to, I want to move you along in your faith and following of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has to address a, a question that's been raised among them that really has struck a blow to their, their assurance in terms of their eternal destiny, or at least the eternal destiny of believers who die before Jesus comes back. Chapter 4, verses 13, I won't read the verses for you, but it, he picks up the thought there. He's, he's addressing this question. Somehow they, they had a thought introduced that if, if a Christian died before Jesus returned, that Christian would not share in the glory of Jesus would not would somehow miss out either in whole or in part in what Jesus would bring with him in the new heavens and the new earth and you can imagine what kind of grief that would cause us if we if we thought our loved ones who had loved and trusted in Jesus in life when they died if Jesus hadn't come back somehow they would miss out on the on the promise of his spiritual blessings and gifts for them and so Paul addresses that and he basically he says hey, no 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 the, those who those who are dead in Christ, who die in faith, attached to Jesus Christ, die in Christ, they don't, not only do they not miss out, they get to go first. They get to, they get to greet Jesus, and he's picking up a, a Roman or a cultural reality where people would go out from a city to meet a great king who was arriving. And, and the, the dead in Christ will be a part of the reception committee when the end comes and Jesus returns. He says, listen, and aren't you, I am, I hope you are comforted that those who die trusting in Jesus have a glorious experience of the presence of Jesus. They miss out on nothing. But Paul goes beyond that. He wants them to continue to grow in their faith and in their holiness, in their following after Jesus. And that leads us all the way back to this little prayer. What is it that Paul desires, his wish for these people? I don't mean that in a, in a worldly way, like we wish for self. I mean, this is what he really hopes for and what he prays for them. 
What does he pray for? And again, be thinking now. I'm just going to give you a couple of thoughts here. How do these things, and this is a good prayer for us to pray, how do these things help us as we come to the moment where we will remember and celebrate and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes? All right, just four things. One, in this little prayer, he begins by speaking of the God of peace. May God himself, the God of peace, and the NIV translation there has kind of added to try and catch two emphasis, God himself and the God of peace. Uh, the ESV and others, I think, have the God of peace himself, begins the verse with the God of peace. Both those things, and so we're gonna emphasize both of them. One, Paul wants them to know that the quality of God that he has in mind as he prays this is that God is the God of peace. It is meant The reality of that being the very nature of God is meant to speak a word of encouragement and comfort to their troubled hearts. The unrest of their souls because of persecution, because theologically they got whacked out about what happens if we die before Jesus comes back. Whatever it was that was troubling their souls, he says, I pray to you, I pray for you to the God of peace. It's a word of comfort. It's a title, a description of comfort for their troubled hearts then and for our troubled hearts today. Today we come, we gather in Jesus' name before the God of peace. The God who is himself peace. And the God who gives peace, provides peace, secures peace, and pours it out in abundance on all those who will bow and receive him and his son. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself came to establish the peace that God desired to have with us. If we are in unrest in this world, is it because we have, we've gone out, we've gone our own way, as it says in Isaiah 53. We have decided we can live without God. We don't need the God who made us, the God who is peace, the God who gives peace to those who are in right relationship with him. We don't need him. We'll find peace on our own terms. How's that going? Uh, How how is it in the world today? How's the world doing at living life and finding peace in the world without the God of peace? You see, sin has separated us from peace because it separates us from God. There There can only be ultimately and finally in the hearts of men and women and children today, in cultures and communities in this sinful world today, apart from the intervention of the God of peace, there can only be unrest in the hearts of men and the hearts of people today. And Jesus was sent, the Son of God, the God of peace, came to secure our peace with God. We must always, when we read of passages like this that speak of the peace of God, we must always bear in mind how it is he secures that peace for us. That's what we do when we share in the emblems. My sin put me at odds with God. I was born into this world with a heart that hated God. And as I grew, I learned how to express that hate in many different ways. And that's true of every human being. And yet the God of peace did not wait for us to come to our senses so that we might seek out peace with Him. He came to establish peace for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, that thought must be in your heart, that recognition that I'd have no peace with God and I would not have the peace of God unless Jesus had taken that place of great turmoil of soul, suffering under God's judgment for my sins so that I could be forgiven. And if you're not a Christian, I would encourage you to think about where it is you're going to go looking for peace these days. I would say run to the God of peace and his offer of peace in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul prays to the God of peace. What God does for us, for those he loves, those he has rescued, those who have repented of sin and trusted in Jesus, those, what God does for his people promotes peace. He has established peace There is a cessation of hostilities between us and our Father. That's a good thing. But he's he's established a relationship by which he gives us peace. He restores the quietness of soul that is lost in the turmoil of selfishness and sin. The quiet peace 
that comes to the one who finds their peace in God. We long for a relief from the stress and the tension and the anxiety of these days. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I know I've said this a hundred times in different ways. Maybe I just say it the same way every time. If you are looking for a restoration of peace for your heart, contentment and rest in these days, do not look to your circumstances or a change in circumstances. Your circumstances will never bring you peace. But Jesus will. Because he is the God of peace. The second thing I want you to have in your mind from this passage as you share in the emblems is this. He says that the God of peace himself, he, he prays, he asks that the, the God of peace himself would do something for them. It's an interesting way of phrasing it, isn't it? Both in the original language, which I'm no expert in, but I just read guys who are experts in that stuff. It's, it's an interesting thing that is described in the original, and then it comes across by way of emphasis in our, in our translation. The God of peace himself, I pray, will do some great thing in your life. And, and I just want you to catch this one thought from Paul and have it in your mind and heart as you, as you share in things that remind you that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, gave his life for you on the cross. It is God Himself that brings us peace. We understand that God uses means, right? Well, what do I mean by means? If you've had a hard day at work and you're all, you have the kind of job where you're all smelly and sweaty or maybe you just have the kind of job where you just feel like you need to have a shower, right? Probably been around too many people and one of them had COVID, so I'm going to have a nice long hot shower and then I'm going to go to bed, whatever. You, you have a shower. The shower is not an end. The shower is a means to the end. I know there's teenagers in the room and parents are going, no, no, I think the shower is the end. I think that's, that is the goal. They stay there and they're not planning on coming out anytime soon. I, I know that's, that's a trial for uh, some families. But fundamentally, I think we would all agree, the shower is not the end. What it, the shower is a means, it's a tool to accomplish something in the end. And that's what, in some ways, small ways, we want to understand about God, that he is doing a work in us, and we'll get to the sanctifying work in a moment. He's doing a work in us, and he uses means to do that. He uses his word, right, to sanctify us, to teach us, to grow us. He uses prayer. That is, not that he always gives us exactly what we thought we needed in prayer, but he meets with us in prayer. He ministers to us through prayer. And he does use our prayers and answer our prayers. And he always does so in a perfect way. And, and he, prayer becomes, again, not an end in of itself. And the word is not an end in and of itself. These are tools that God uses, uses us to bring us to himself. And there are many other things. He uses people, doesn't he? I mentioned that last week. The people who sent uh, scriptures to me. There were... There was a spiritual blessing for me through both the Word and the people who expressed that to me. The, the, the people of God, the voices and the presence of God's people are a tool in God's hands to minister grace to us. And even these elements. These are a means of grace for us. We always have to be careful. There's nothing, well, and it's pretty hard to think that there's anything magical in those little packages, isn't it? There's nothing magical, there's nothing particularly special about the, the drink in here or the bread-like substance on the top. And I don't mean to demean what they represent, I just mean the, these are just material things that in and of themselves are of no benefit to anyone in this room. But when they are taken up in the hands of the God of peace, these are a means by which he pours grace into the lives of his people. Not because of what these are, but because of what they represent. They've been given to us as a tool, as we read in 1 Corinthians 11, to take our minds and our hearts back to that moment, to remember and proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. That act of sacrifice and submission and substitution that brings us peace. We remember that through the means that God has given to us. 
But please remember this. The means in and of themselves are nothing. Now, you can think that about this drink and this bread, but when I say that about the Word, that almost sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? That the Word in and of itself is nothing? Listen, the Word is a powerful tool in the salvation and transformation of the lives of people because the Word is wielded by God. It is in the powerful working of the Spirit taking the Word and cutting through the the hardness of a a sinful heart that refuses God. And and in the power of the Spirit, there's an awakening that takes place as that sword penetrates the soul and eyes are opened and sparks fly and an individual who wanted nothing to do with God suddenly in the mercies of God, by the power of God, through the Word of God, they are awakened to their need of God and they run to the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't the means that we want to focus on. It's the one who wields those means It's not the thing, it's God Himself. And it's a fine balance. So on one hand, I want to tell you this. Take up these means today. Pray now, even in this moment, that God would prepare your heart to take these material things and that you will be changed, transformed, fed, that a deep spiritual work of grace will happen as you remember that Jesus died for you. He died for you. He died because of your sin so that you could be forgiven and made right with God, have peace with God. Pray that, take up these means. It is, it, is a, it is a dangerous thing for God's people to neglect joining together around the table of communion and sharing in these emblems. It is a dangerous thing because we are keeping ourselves from the means, the place where it says, this is where I'll give you more grace. It is a danger, take up the word. Because it is a dangerous thing not to uh, to keep ourselves from the place where God pours in grace. He says, I pour grace through this. Spend time in prayer. Spend time with God's people. Do not make it a habit. Build your life around the priorities of the means by which God will pour grace into your life. If you're feeling like you're starving for grace in these days, I suspect it's because you go nowhere near the means by which God will pour grace into your life. It is... Hard to imagine that you're giving yourself wholeheartedly to the Word and to prayer and to fellowship with God's people, to these means by which He strengthens, revives, rebukes, encourages, and instructs us. You're giving yourself fully to that and you still feel starved for grace? I don't think so. We feel starved for grace because we're neglecting all of those things. These things too. So God Himself uses means, but one word of caution. Beware the dangers of superstition. We don't worship the means. We don't worship Scripture. There are some religions where if you were to write in what they consider sacred text, that would be blasphemy. Well, my Bible is full of notes, and I circle things and underline things, and I write questions. I I use it as a study tool because while the content is the very Word of God for me, the book itself is, contains that message, but it's not, I don't, I don't worship the thing. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament. You might remember the Israelites who had a problem. God loved them, made them a nation, gave them much grace, and they sinned over and over and over again. At one point in Numbers chapter 21, they are being punished by God for their sin, and a great plague is, uh, of snakes has broken out, and they, people are getting bit, and they're dying. And the people, again, they finally repent, and, and God provides a means by which they can be saved. Do you remember the story? Moses makes a bronze snake, and he puts it on a pole, and he holds it up in the middle of the camp, and the one who looks to the snake is healed. That is, the looking is an expression of their turning from the sin and turning towards God. So they had this tool that brought about the both physical and spiritual healing of the nation. Well, you know what happened a few hundred years later? A man named Hezekiah got on the throne, and it says in in 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 18, it says Hezekiah, who was a man who loved God, he had to destroy that thing because the people had made sacrifices to it. They had turned the means by which God had given them grace into the object of their worship. 
now we don't have time. It, it's a good discussion. I would encourage you to maybe chat about this after dinner. Where are we in danger of taking some of the means that God has given us and making more of them, making them into sacred things in ways that they are not? Be careful. But the big comfort is this. The God of peace himself is the one that Paul prays to. And what does he ask for? This is where it gets serious for us in terms of particulars, and I have to give it to you very quickly this morning. I encourage you to read through this, the both letters uh, on your own. It would only take you, maybe both letters would take you 15 or 20 minutes to read. He prays that God himself, the God of peace, would sanctify them. The NIV has it through and through. Uh, other translations have complete, and that's what it means. He prays that God would completely sanctify them in anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the question is, oh, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? To pray for someone's sanctification by the, God, the hand of God himself, that God will bring about this sanctification? The challenge is, what does that mean? What is that supposed to look like in your life and mine? This prayer for God to sanctify them, to both set them apart for himself and make them holy for himself, those two images come together with sanctify, are, they are pregnant with all of the instruction that Paul has given already in the book. That is, when he says, I want God to sanctify you, they don't have to go, oh, I wonder what that will look like. He's already told them what that will look like when God answers this prayer. Let me just give you a quick snapshot. They are told in chapter 3, verse 12, and 4, verses 9 and 10, that they are to love one another. They're to love people. That people are to matter to them. That they're to have relationships of love, like Paul has described, of their love for one another. And so you and I are called in another way, through another text, to the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the command of Christ. Love one another. By this will all men know that you love one another. You are my disciples. We are to love one another. Let me just say this, and I hope you understand, I say this with, with love and grace. I just want you to know this morning that in this place, I'm praying, and I hope, I trust you are praying as well, that people will always matter more than protocols. That people will always matter more than mass. Whatever your conviction about those things, and I don't care what they are in this moment, I just want you to remember that God has called you, He is sanctifying you in this way. He wants you never to allow any frustration, any disagreement, any sin to come between you and the other believers He's put in your life. You love one another and don't let anything, don't let the enemy in and nothing in between. Sanctification looks like a growing love for people. He talks in chapter 4 verses 3 to 8 about sexual purity. That's a huge, an ongoing and huge reality in every culture, in every age. He calls us to sexual purity on his terms. He calls them and us to humble, sincere, genuine, hardworking lifestyles. At the end of chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, they, they should work hard. They should live simple lives. That they, they should, People should watch their lives and see something that distinguishes them from a, a world gone mad, under panic, under always wanting, trying to get ahead, get a little bit more, uh, a little more security, financial and otherwise, and the world's gone crazy. God's people should be living lives that reflect humility and sincerity and peace. Hurt, working hard at whatever it is God has given us to do. He says sanctification looks like honor and encouragement from God's people to the spiritual leaders in their lives. Chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. He says in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, that they are to actively disciple one another. Let me read those ones for you. When you think about your relationships with God's people, do you think about what it is you can get or should get, or do you think about what it is you give? Listen to these words. Verse 14, chapter 5, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. 
Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Do you see the emphasis there? If you're a Christian, this instruction comes to you and it doesn't even give a whiff of, make sure there is someone in your life who is there to serve your needs, to give you the things you want, to stroke you when you're sad. Make sure you've got people around you who are going to feed into your lives. Now, before I go too far with that thought, there are passages of Scripture which encourage us to build relationships with people who will feed into our lives. That's true. But here, the prayer for sanctification, that the God of peace would sanctify us, is filled with this thought. How are you using your spiritual life and growth and resources to be a blessing and a help to the people around you? It's an outward look. I don't know how many times I've had the conversation with somebody either from here or from another church and they, they'll say something like, oh yeah, I used to go such and such a church and I left and nobody called. Nobody called. I, sometimes I, I usually bite my tongue, but sometimes I'll say something hopefully nice and gracious and I go, well, why would they notice you were gone? Like they, they usually describe a relationship in which they sat back and waited for everybody to come to them. Nobody's coming. Nobody's serving me. Nobody's, nobody calls me. Well, pick up the phone. Call somebody. That's what this passage says. You see what I mean? Again, I'm not saying we don't all have to respond. At times we miss people. That's true. But this passage is saying when God is at work in our lives, he's going to give us a heart that looks outward, not inward. All right, I'm taking longer with this list than I, I had intended. He also says in chapter 5, verse 16, 18, sanctification majors in joy, rejoice always, prayer, pray continually, and gratitude, give thanks. That those are major hallmark character qualities of people who are being sanctified by the God of peace. Also, the discernment in spiritual matters, verses 19 and 22. Being able to tell good from evil and making the right choices along the way. These are the things Paul has given to them and said, pursue these things. These are things that come to you and I today, and you need to go back and read and go, are these things true of me? Are these things important to me? Are these things that I want God to grow in me? Am I going after these things? When Paul gives them the instructions, he's, he's expecting them to go after these things. That it's their responsibility to pursue these things. And after he's he set all of that out before them, what does he do? He prays that the God of peace will do something that only he can do. That he will grow these things in them. The God of peace will sanctify you. Because only God can make these things grow in you and I. So as you examine your own heart, as you in a moment share in these things, as you think about this list and other, maybe other passages that God has convicted your heart, there's, there's some things that need to grow or change, be transformed. Pursue them, but pray like Paul, God, my God of peace, will you please grow these things in me? Sanctify me, because it won't happen apart from his work of grace that is available to us, a reality for us, because of the cross. One last thought, and these, this is an overlapping thought with the, the kept blame, or the um, uh, sanctification thought. He says uh, that your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Kept blameless. It's not a separate request, but it kind of piles on top of the first. And reinforces that last thought I just gave you, that God must do a work, and if God does the work, we will be kept. We will be preserved. What comes to your mind when you think of the word preserved? Delicious jams and jellies? That's not quite what we mean when we say God keeps his people, but he does preserve us. It is an ongoing life-giving activity of God in the lives of his people that he, he keeps them. And he keeps all of them. I don't mean all of the individuals. I mean all of the individual he keeps. We won't go into the, the question of how the human being, a human being is made up, spirit, soul, and body. 
there's obviously two spiritual and, and uh, uh, mental will components there, and then there's the material component there. And Paul is saying that God, I pray that God would keep all of you, that is your whole being, blameless. That isn't to say that we will be without sin. Paul knows that they are going to struggle with sin and there's a need for confession and repentance. But that's part of the keeping of God. He convicts us of sin. He pulls us back to repentance and confession and, and he sanctifies us. He draws him, us closer to himself. He restores us in our walk with him. And nothing will interfere or allow his hand to weaken on the, hand, on the lives of those who are his. We are safe in his hands even unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. If you read the first bits in 1 Thessalonians, those passages I talked about what sanctification looks like, and you just try and do that, it'll wipe you out. Do that in your own strength. I'm just going to be a good Christian as described in this passage. It will wipe you out. No, all of our energy in pursuing those things must flow from an understanding and from the life-giving relationship we have with the God of peace who is faithful. And he will do it. It is hard for us to get into uh, a a really good understanding of what it means when we say God is faithful. Does it just mean he's reliable? He's dependable? Yes, he is reliable and dependable. But it's much deeper and richer than that. In his very nature, he can't be anything but faithful. That is, everything he has determined to do, all that he would do, wants to do, and is determined to do, he will do because he is faithful. That is for your benefit and mine. That is, he will faithfully complete the work sanctifying, saving work he's begun in you in Christ. He will complete that. He is faithful to that. And it's directed towards you and it's meant for your comfort and confidence as you share in these emblems this morning. If you're a little nervous about your spiritual walk these days, maybe you should be. But know this, God is faithful. Throw yourself on his mercy, on his strength, on his wisdom, on his grace. Pray that God of peace would recover you and and revive your soul and your walk with him because he is faithful. It is for your comfort. But the faithfulness of God is deeper than that. And it's reflected in these emblems that take us back to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus die? Well, Jesus died because we're sinful and we need someone who can take our guilt and sin and remove that from us. And Jesus died for us because he is without sin and we need someone who can give us righteousness so that we can have peace with God. That is true. But why, in terms of faithfulness, does Jesus die? Well, God promised he would send someone and he would die. That is true. The faithfulness of God and the assurance of God's people, let me put that the other way around. Your assurance this morning that you will be with Jesus one day must be grounded in the faithfulness of God to himself. You know why Jesus died? Because God's reputation is at stake. Because his own glory is at stake. He sent his son to the cross to rescue lost sinners because God said before the beginning of time, I will have a people of holiness and worship and praise and they will be mine forever. That was his declared will from before the beginning of time. His reputation is at stake. Is that going to come to pass? Satan tries to destroy it? All is lost at the garden? No. God says, I am faithful. Not only is he faithful again to us, but that faithfulness to us is an extension of his faithfulness to himself. It's rooted in his very nature and essence and character. And so as we share in these emblems, we ought to thank God. Thank you, God, that you are faithful to your word. You will do what you said because it's your reputation at stake. And you will not prevaricate. You won't lead us astray. You are faithful. And so we look to these emblems and we remember the one who died for us, the one whom God promised to send, and he did send. The one whom God promised would rescue us, and he has rescued us. And we share in these emblems and we remember the one God promised would come again for us. And he will come again for us. Because the one who calls you is faithful 
and he will do it. How can we know that God will ultimately finally win and bring us home to be with him without sin and in his glory forever? It is because Jesus died on the cross for our sin and was raised by the power of God to everlasting life. And that both demonstrates and secures the salvation and sanctification of all who trust in him. He who promised is faithful. We're going to sing a song in a moment, but let me read you the words of another song just to reinforce these thoughts, and then we'll sing together. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. For my life, he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast.